The first web comic strips reflected the office cubicles and quake death matches of the late 1990s. These comic strips moved gaming culture from the fringes of society into the mainstream and made it cool to be a nerd. I am pleased to have Scott Adams join us now for a conversation about his guy, Dilbert. Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for having me. How did it come about for you? Well, for me, it was uh, the, the shortest version of the story is that I was working at Pacific Bell in my little cubicle, and uh, one day I bought a book on how to become a cartoonist. Uh, I'd always been a doodler, and I read the directions in the book, and it tells you how to send off your cartoons to various syndication companies. And I sent off my little photocopies to uh, half a dozen companies, and United Media called me and said, uh, how would you like to be a syndicated cartoonist? And I said, I would, yeah, I said, I would like that. And how much of Dilbert is you? I've estimated that at least a third of Dilbert is me. Uh, got the same glasses, yeah. had that same cubicle yeah. job, um, I've had his luck. Uh, but he's also a composite of people I've worked with. Yeah. Schultz, I think, said that Charlie Brown was 60% him and 40% of his imagination. So you're saying it's 33% of you, a composite of other people, and then maybe a third... Yeah, I'd say he's about 70% people that I've known directly, and, and yeah. about, a, about a third me, personally. Yeah. The, uh, the notion of Dilbert, how do you explain this phenomenon? Well, it, it's one of those things that seems really obvious after you do it. Yeah. But here were, I don't know, 45 million people in the United States alone who were in cubicles, and they had no, no voice. They had all this common experience, but they had no way to express it. And so when I started doing cartoons, originally I wasn't really focusing on his office life, but after I started running my email and people said, we like that office stuff you keep doing, I started doing more of it. It was just a kind of an obvious thing to do. And people said, you know, you're, you're talking for us. So it became huge, kind of accidentally. <laughs> There's Mike Floyd. Uh, Mike's our network engineer. Uh, let's go say hello to him. Hey, Mike! Yeah. Um, um, you, you didn't tell me we were doing this today. Um, hey. I'm Mike Floyd. I'm the network engineer here. I'm responsible for managing all of the routers and maintaining our network. We're running a variety of box in here, but they all talk to the rotor router 4000s on the rack in the machine room. We have an OC3 throttled to 15 megabits at the moment, and I'm analyzing reports this week to see when we'll have to bump our ceiling up. And oh boy! Can that ever cause trouble if you don't maintain a keen sharp eye on your load balancing? Load balancing at the switch would be nice, but right now we don't have that luxury. And uh, oh that? Huh. Well, it's only Pez. It's not like it's addictive. I can stop any time I want to. Oh, will you look at that? The pipe is full uh, of drop packets. I'll need to uh, pick them up off the floor. What the? Нет кемерс! Но кемерс!
Speaking of which. Patrick and I are really excited about this. Our next guest writes the uh, comic strip. Patrick, pretty much every day, will say, did you see it? Did you see it? And it's user, oh, it's uh, user friendly. A humorous take on the office world of uh, open source. It's kind of like Dilbert for the open source. What would fanatic. Dilbert used to be like, you know. Yeah, when he was still years and years cool and hip. He goes so by the name oh, Ilya. Ooh, not a geek he'll never be back on this show, I guess. Ooh. Sorry. No, I love. No, I love Dilbert. But it, there is there is a certain similarity. Yeah. But this is more for the geek. Uh, Ilya is the uh, author. He's here as, a, and I don't know if anybody really knows this, but his real name is J.D. Frazier. Welcome to the show, J.D. Oh, thanks very much. Are we outing you? I mean, it, <laughs> no, it's, it's been known for a while now. People know your name. Yeah, they do. Why Ilya? Wasn't that uh, the uh, Homer's uh, one of Homer's it two was, books? Yeah, Odyssey, and, and you're like, well, it's because I used to be a classical studies major. Oh, really? And it was one of my favorite poems. Oh, neat. Right. But I, you misspelled it. I did it on purpose because when I created the name, I figured, well, there'd be other people with the name Iliad out there. Not very many, but I'm sure there'd be a few. So I added another L, and sure enough, about 12 months later, there were 200 Iliads <laughs> on ICQ. <laughs> but you were so you were net savvy right from the beginning. I I thought I was anyway. What were you doing before you became a full-time comic artist? I was the creative director at a at a small boutique ISP in British Columbia, and so as being a lifetime doodler, I, I drew the first cartoon strip, passed that around the office, and uh, my coworkers really enjoyed it. So I did another one, and I did another one. Finally, my business partner partner suggested that I put the cartoons that I had up on the web. Mm -hmm. So I planned on doing maybe 30 of them. And I was going to fold it after that because it does take a lot of work. Oh, I bet. Put that sort of thing out. Yeah, I mean, every day. Think about it. It's, it's a cartoon a day, seven days a week, 365 Exhausting. days a year. It is. Yeah, it really is. What it, your inspiration was at the time, the office life that you were in. Very much so. True for Scott Adams of Dilbert, too. Yeah. How do you maintain your inspiration now that you're no longer in that uh, setting? Well, a fortunate thing is that the audience that I have is uh, very participatory. So I encourage them to. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Patrick. Participatory, right here. How many ideas have you said? No, I, I just, I just, I'm a lurker. I just, I just oh, read. Right. Yeah, I'd say maybe 60% uh, of the stories that make it into the strip are from people who read the strip. That doesn't surprise me. I think one of the successes of this, and I, I know it's true for us, is that we see words and phrases that we identify with that are part of our subculture, you mm -hmm. know, and immediately qualifies you as a geek. It's, That's right. You know, the fact that you say, you know. Space Marine, boom, as we saw in that first video. That's right. It, you, we know you know. Yes. You're one of us. That's right. Yeah. I've always been a geek, really. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm a, I'm a technical guru, but mm -hmm. I, I've been a power user and I, and I enjoy technology. Well, the internet is booming with everything, including web comics. It's just like the Sunday newspaper comics, only online and it's free. One of the most popular is PvP or Player vs. Player. As CW 33's Barry Carpenter reports, the comic strip comes to life right here in North Texas. 37-year-old Scott Kurtz is the mind behind PvP, a comic strip devoted to the crazy interpersonal relationships with the fictional video game magazine. Every character is quirky. Scott has been drawing and writing comics since the fourth grade. I just wanted to be in the newspapers like uh, Jim Davis with Garfield. In fact, all of my comic strips were about cats uh, that looked just like Garfield, I have to admit. Then, in the 1990s, the internet took off as newspaper readership declined. Enter Scott and PVP. It just kind of happened naturally. It's not like there was a big plan or that we were trailblazers. It's just, uh, you know, no one else would take us uh, in the newspapers or books, so we just started doing it ourselves. Scott was a part-time webcomic. Then his wife said, go for it. And for this story, I got my own panel. Scott's comic PVP went online in 1998. Now he gets over 250,000 readers a day and 11 million hits a month. Scott says most web comics only write three strips a week, but he writes seven, and he can't cut back even though he's the boss. No, you would think I'm the boss. My readers are the boss. You are incorrect, sir. <laughs> they are in charge of my output, not me. But on the internet, everyone's pretty hungry for content, especially anything that'll keep them from having to start work an extra five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cost them anything. 
And, uh, and if they end up liking it, they have no problem buying a t-shirt or a book. And Scott sells plenty of them. Everything from t-shirts to comic books shipped to far-flung places like New Zealand, South Africa, and Brazil. Their childhood dreams have come to life on the internet. That amazing plan B that my dad insisted I had, never really established that plan B. <laughs> Zip, bang, boom. Here's to plan Comics A, working out. Barry Carpenter, CW33 News at 9. Back to you, America. Okay. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. Uh, what merchandise are you selling? Obviously not weight loss products. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm selling these I things. can't believe I haven't run out of fat jokes yet. See? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, You've that's got... It. That's my whole pitch. This oh. is this is basically you in purple. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of imagination went into designing this. You looked in the mirror and you made it blue. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Romero of Ironstorm. I'm here to tell you that Daikatana will be great. You guys know I'm good for it. Like Doom. You remember Doom? I did that. And Quake, right? That was me too. Design, Design is law. law! Nice try, John. No game. No wiener. So how did, and how did Penny Arcade get started? Uh, we actually entered a contest that Next Generation Magazine was running. They were looking for a cartoon about games, and, and we entered. And didn't win, uh, but had so much fun making them that we just kept doing it. So it was just like randomly? Yeah, I mean, we, we were making our own comics and stuff on the side anyway, and the, that contest was just sort of a kick in the butt we needed to, to, really, to really give it a but shot. Before that, we did the kind of comics we did are probably more fit for this sort of, you know, traditional Comic-Con type audience. Like, it was superheroes and you know, feats of uh, acrobatics and dangerous combat and, you know, like, it hadn't occurred to us to make comics about video games, just because it, it wasn't really done yet, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. it just, it hadn't occurred to us to do it until this contest. So, there was stuff before Penny Arcade. Oh, yeah, lots. Oh, yeah, yeah but it was bad, bad stuff. But it was all, it was all, it was all what you might think of as traditional, like, you know, capes and tights type stuff. So, like, how did you get, you guys meet making comics? More or less. Well, yeah, we met in journalism class in high school. I was the cartoonist for the high school paper, and he was a writer. So yeah, 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 it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we met, and then he. I, I think you you gave me the impression that you wanted somebody to write with. Yeah, yeah, I was looking for someone to help me out with some stories. So cool. So your alter egos are they representative of yourselves, or are they exaggerations of yourselves? I would say they're they're profound exaggerations of ourselves. But I mean, most of the things that happen in the strip have a have a true origin. It's just that, you know, our regular lives aren't going to be fascinating for most people. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we try to put some kind of spin on it, or sometimes we think it'd be funny or something that happened to me happened to him or something like that. All right. No, I got it. Yeah? I got it. I got what we need. What's this? Are we being filmed? I'm being filmed. I never know when I'm going to do something incredible, so um, obviously at tremendous expense, I do have... Um, Men with cameras follow me. There's a lot of people here. Man. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that, you know, like I said, it's you know, it'll cost a hundred fucking dollars. Yeah. Right. Um, hang on. Foraging now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an urban forager. Exquisite. If you haven't heard of Penny Arcade Expo, you're missing out in a major way. PAX is one of the greatest experiences a gamer can have. The event is a three-day orgy of the very best in PC, tabletop, and video gaming. The event is named after the ubiquitous online comic strip created by Jerry Hawkins and Mike Krahulik. Well, this is our fifth year, so around, you know, four years ago, we had gone to a bunch of conventions, a lot of comic book stuff, and they always have, you know, one room that sort of got video game stuff in it, and we thought, there should be a place where people can go and get this, you know, a full show, just just the video game stuff. The first year it was 3,000 people total, um, and we're expecting between 45 and 50 this year. In July of 2006, organizers of E3 announced that the show would be invite only, and subsequent years have been stripped down vastly. Since then, PAX has become the largest North American gathering for video gamers. Publishers and developers have taken notice. By the second year, we started to get publishers, you know, I mean, the first year Microsoft came, but it was really just some guys that threw stuff in their car and came over, literally. 
second year, then we had a couple other big ones. By the third year, we had Nintendo, and it just sort of grew and grew until this year. I think we've got pretty much everybody. On the show floor, gamers can get up close and personal with upcoming high-profile games. Everyone we talked to had a list of titles they wanted to check out. At StarCraft 2, see, I'm so psyched about that. Gears of War 2, I came to test out Spore. I'm a massive Guild War freak. Besides supplanting E3, PAX also features a huge bring-your-own-computer area. Essentially, it's a LAN party wrought large. If that sounds too high-tech for you, you can opt for some old-school tabletop and board game action. One of the highlights of PAX is the Omega-thon, a six-round challenge where every round is a different game. The grand prize is an all-expenses-paid trip to Japan to experience the Tokyo Game Show. Point up, point out the pixels, but don't miss your button finger. Another highlight is a set of music performances by nerdcore rappers like... The world's 579th greatest rapper, MC Punch Alon! When I hit it, I hit L, shift, O to the quote, and then I loud if you know the turn, I'm the nerd core, right? You holler, I hit L, shift, O to the quote, and then I loud if you know the turn, I'm the nerd core, right? You holler, I hit L, shift, O to the quote, and then I loud if you know the turn, I'm the nerd core, right? You holler, I hit L, shift, O to the quote, and then I loud you know the turn, I'm the nerd core, right? You holler, nerd core, on the mic up, yo, we back. To strike up this band of nebbishes, cultivate nebulous fetishes. The FPS, or PG, or M, M, Paul, in the obsession to blather over by blog or BDS. Step in, possess, hold the geekish miss your brain rate and frags that ain't both impress. Yes, your infinity for us are inside of some amusement. The last of the adult part of the fun where you let me spin up. Synthesis to partake of bigger dramas get you brain than a sniper. Step and possess hone thy geekishness. geekishness. So he's saying, don't improve your skills. Yeah, don't. Claim. You're a geek yet. Yeah, embrace it. Improve. Sharpen. Sharpen it. Yeah, exactly. And he's saying, well, your frame rates and frags. Well, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. frags your, your frame date, rate yeah. and frags to date both, both impress. So not only your frame rate is essentially saying you've got a computer capable of displaying these modern games at a, at a respectable, well actually, an impressive yeah. mm -hmm. frame a, per second. <laughs> in addition, uh, your talent at playing the games has allowed you to accrue uh, an impressive score. Frags, that's how many people you killed. If you branded a sniper bitch there we go. or rocket mama humper. Oh. Damn. So now they're saying, okay, you're, you're so good that people are complaining that you're cheating. They're saying you're a you're a sniper bitch. You're so, one of these guys. Yeah, exactly. No skill. No skill. You just get the most powerful weapon. Hide you, somewhere. Hide somewhere. You probably got right. some script running in the background. Uh, you know. Right.